The Philippines appears to have elected former dictator Ferdinand Marcos' son as its new president. Marcos Jr., who goes by the nickname Bong Bong, had more than double the votes of his challenger, Lenny Robredo. Speaking to his supporters on Tuesday, Marcos Jr. urged people to judge him by his actions and not by his family history. His win marks a return to power of the Marcos family, which is accused of running a brutal dictatorship before a people power revolution restored democracy in the 80s. On Monday, he thanked his supporters for their work. I want to thank you for all you have done for us. There are thousands of you out there, volunteers, parallel groups, political leaders that have cast their lot with us. Because of their belief in our message of unity, because of their belief in the candidates. Hundreds of human rights activists and students have been demonstrating against the outcome of the poll and what appears to be a landslide victory for Marcos. The protesters clashed with police close to the offices of the Philippines Election Committee. They are denouncing what they claimed were irregularities after some vote counting machines broke. Authorities say the number of machines affected was small. Many demonstrators are also angered by the return to power of the disgraced Marcos family with its history of human rights violations and fraud. And joining me now for more from Manila is our Asia Pacific Bureau Chief Georg Martes. Georg, how serious are these complaints of a breakdown in vote counting machines? It came, became very clear, uh, quickly clear in the election night that uh, a couple of those machines, 1,800 to be exact, uh, had problems and broke down. In fact, I was in a polling station in Naga in the stronghold of Leonie, uh, Lenny Robredo, uh, and one of those machines where I was in the, in the polling station broke down. So people were given the choice, fill in the uh, election papers and leave them for others to be fed to the machine once it's fixed or to wait. And many choose uh, to wait, so there were long queues. But overall, one has to say uh, that will not threaten uh, the result. Uh, Ferdinand Marcos is up for a historic uh, win and probably an absolute majority in this election. Uh, speaking about the choice that voters had, I mean, they were basically choosing between a dictator's son, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., or Bong Bong, and the outgoing vice president and human rights champion, Lenny Robredo. Uh, help us understand what Marcos's pitch was to the public that gave him this landslide? Well, he talked about sweeping economic reforms, gifts to, to the poor, and you have to understand that the Philippines were hard hit in the COVID pandemic. Many people died. A lot of people have been uh, pushed into poverty further than they already are. So uh, he appealed uh, to those voters in particular how he will do all of that. Uh, he kept to himself largely because he didn't attend press conferences. He didn't allow questions uh, from reporters. Um, and also he talked a lot about unity. And uh, many Filipinos uh, have said unity is important, particularly after this election. Many, many said to me, look, uh, whoever wins this election, one has to secure uh, that there will be a peaceful uh, way out of this. The, the election process and the campaigning has been so divisive and so polarized that it will really be the task of the president to keep peace and to keep the people together. So, Georg, just based on what you are saying, what does this mean for the Philippines going forward? How does President Marcos unite this country? That's really a good question, Biresh, and, and uh, many Filipinos are keen uh, to see how he's going to achieve that. Uh, one thing I think you can expect, he's teamed up with the daughter of the current president, uh, Sara Duterte, and uh, seeing that the, uh, the style of her father was a rather authoritarian style, f fighting a bloody war uh, on drugs, uh, many expect that uh, this style will be continued in the in the Marcos era of the presidency with the return of a, 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 a dynasty of, of politicians from the Marcos era. Some even fear that it will get worse. Others say he cannot afford that, uh, to, to let that happen. Right. But how in all of this the unity thing will, will work, uh, with Lenny Robredo being really exactly the opposite uh, of, of Marcos, uh, it will be extremely interesting to see. Georg Martis will leave it there for the time being, but thank you so much for joining us from Manila. 
He may still be an untested leader of a nation, but Bongbong Marcos is no stranger to politics. His dictator father ruled the Philippines for two decades until a people's revolt. But Marcos Jr. has managed quite a comeback for a family once synonymous with abuse and corruption. Celebrations for Ferdinand Marcos Jr. on the streets of Manila. His likely win would cement his family's return to power in the Philippines, following the revolution that toppled his late father in 1986. The elder, Ferdinand Marcos, ruled the Philippines as a dictator for two decades, and his tenure was infamous for its corruption and brutality. For many, it was unthinkable that the Marcos clan would ever run for the highest office again. After returning from exile, the Marcoses returned to public life in the Philippines with several family members taking on political positions. Many of Bong Bong's younger supporters don't connect him to his father's crimes. We believe that BBM is starkly different from his father. Ferdinand Bongbong Marcos ran his election campaign on promises of unity, but has failed to explain his policy plans in detail. Analysts warn that his administration will most likely mean more strongman posturing and less democratic freedoms and transparency. Joining me now for more analysis on this is journalist and analyst Anna Santos. Anna, help us understand how a country that overthrew a dictatorship 36 years ago elects the last dictator's son as president. Well, Barash, I think disinformation had a lot to do with it. We saw how the Marcus machinery really tried to, and successfully, as we can see, scrub clean the legacy of the horrors of martial law. But I think we also have to look at one other thing that was missing. You know, there are no institutions in the Philippines that commit the horrors of martial law to memory. Unlike here in Berlin, you see it everywhere. There's both acknowledgement and atonement for the atrocities of World War II. In the Philippines, we don't have anything of that sort, so much to document the horrors of martial law in our textbooks, in our streets. We only have it in our memories. And when you have that combined with disinformation campaign, you see memory is a faulty thing. It's easy to reconstruct, it's easy to rewrite, and therefore, that's where you have now Marcus Jr. coming in with his own new narrative of a rebranding of the Marcus name and what he promises as a campaign and as a banner of unity for the country. Uh, but then you also had uh, the, the same uh, Bong Bong Marcos Jr. going up against Lenny Robredo, uh, his challenger in this election in 2016, and him losing in the vice presidential race. So, so, so clearly there, there are a, a number of people in the Philippines who can potentially see through this sort of whitewashing. I mean, what is it uh, about this vote? Are people in the Philippines not democracy-minded? I think there's also what we have to understand about the psyche of the Filipino voter. You know how we say voters vote with their stomach? Yes, the Filipino voter also votes with their stomach, but they also so much vote with their heart. And I think it's an equal measure. So when you think about you know, how the analysts have analyzed the campaign messages of both Marcos and Robredo, who are the top runners in this election, you have Marcos talking about a campaign of unity. You have Robredo talking about um, radical love and how it's more important to unite uh, amidst the political hatred and divisiveness. When you look at these two messages and how they resonate so much with the Filipino voter, you think about how the psyche of the Filipino voter is, yes, what kind of jobs are you going to give me? What is your political platform? But it's also so much the aspiration of what kind of future are you going to give me as my leader? It's so much a courtship. You know, when you look at the campaigns in the Philippines, there's a lot of singing, a lot of dancing, a lot of political promises. You know, it's a relationship that a Filipino voter wants to be able to entrust their future to this leader. And when you think about a message that resonates, you have a Marcos who has whitewashed the horrors of his family brand name and his history and comes across as now, one strategist said it, he looks like a K-pop star. And then he tells you, I can give you a feeling of unity then that's where you're going to not only put your heart, Varesh, but also cast your vote, as we have seen in this last election. 
Speaking about the people who have cast their vote, what about the kind of people who voted for Lenny Dobredo, for instance, the outgoing vice president and a human rights champion? I mean, where does that leave the Philippines now? I think it's important to also note that you know, I've said it in past interviews, the Lenny campaign was not a campaign, it was a movement. I wish, Biresh, I could tell you, I could make you feel the emotion on the ground of the Robredo campaign. And it's important here to note that the campaign, the organic voluntarism that spurred the campaign for, Red, for Lenny was not just a no to the Marcoses, but also a yes to what Lenny Robredo represented. She had, uh, she was as vice president during the pandemic. She was able to really show that she could deliver results uh, with her pandemic response that was tangible, that was uh, something that you could count and track. She was able to do this with the support of people who poured in their donations and also private companies who placed their trust in her by also pouring in their donations to her campaign for, uh, for a pandemic response. Now, what does that tell us? That tells us that left us, the Filipino people, with a sense of what good governance not only feels like, not right. only what it looks like, but also that it is possible. And therefore, since it's possible, the Filipino public is now in a position to demand right. for it.